That's what Easter is about. Jesus came out of the grave, and we're going to one day as well. Amen? Praise the Lord. Take your Bibles and turn with me to one of the greatest chapters in all the New Testament, Romans chapter 8. In just a minute, we'll look at one of the, begin with one of the greatest verses in the Bible, Romans 8, 28, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. Today, Bellevue Baptist Church, we join millions of Christians around the world celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. He existed in eternity past as God the Son. And then at just the right time, He was born of a virgin, consequently free from a sinful nature. And while He was on this earth, He was tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. And then he was condemned by the Jews and crucified by the Romans. And on the cross he suffered and died for the sins of all mankind until he cried out to Telestai, paid in full, it is finished. And then he was buried. They laid him in a borrowed grave for three days. But I'm glad to tell you that Jesus rose bodily victoriously and eternally from the grave, and He is alive. He appeared to His disciples for 40 days, then He ascended back to the right hand of the Father, where the Father is making all of His enemies a footstool for His feet. And Jesus, as we speak, is in heaven. He's preparing heaven for those of us who know Him. We've got a home in heaven that outshines the sun. He is interceding for His children who have been regenerated through the power of His Holy Spirit. And He is preparing for His glorious return when everyone will see Him and every eye will behold Him and every tongue shall declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For every Bible-believing Christian, Easter is a celebration about all of these things. We celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ has come to this earth lived and died, was raised from the dead, is on His throne, and He will come again. We today celebrate what I want to call this morning the good news, the gospel of Easter. Look there in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is or can be against us. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with Jesus freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who is the one? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one? Now look at verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is now at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of God? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Go back, if you will, to one verse, verse 34. Who is the one who condemns us? Christ Jesus is He who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, 
who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Let's pray together. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things from thy law. Thank you that Jesus is Lord, Satan is bound, and Lord, we are listening to your word. Give us ears to hear what you would say, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, and if that's your prayer, say amen. amen. First thing I want to share with you out of this beautiful, simple, single, sovereign verse that talks all about Easter I want you to know there's good news today. Easter is good news about a bloody tree. You say, Pastor, how can a bloody tree be good news? Well, that's what the Bible says. Look at verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and that's good news. The Bible says he was predestined to die. He was the Son of God slain from the foundation of the world. Across Bethlehem's cradle lay the shadow of Calvary's cross. God predestined from eternity past that Jesus would die as an atoning sacrifice for our sins on that sacred tree. Only Jesus could die for our sins because only Jesus was born of a virgin. Only Jesus was born free from sinful nature. Only Jesus lived a perfect life without sin. Only Jesus went to the cross to die to bear the sins of all mankind. He lived that sinless life. He died that vicarious death, and He rose from the dead. Jesus Christ, in the Old Testament, His death was prophesied by every sacrifice in the Old Testament. Every sacrifice in the Old Testament said that there is blood that will be shed one day that will atone for all sins. We read in Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Do you see what he's saying? The life is in the blood. By the way, medicine and scientists have found that out. One day they said, oh, guess what? Life is in the blood. It was in Leviticus hundreds of years before they discovered that. Amen? And all of a sudden they're saying life is in the blood. God says, yes, life is in the blood. And that's why blood has to be shed. You can't just die. It has to be by blood because out of that blood will come new life. And the New Testament theologians picked that up and saw in the blood of Jesus the redemption of Almighty God. Ephesians 2.13, the greatest theologian aside from Jesus ever to speak, the Apostle Paul said, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away, you were distant, you were separated from God, but now you have been brought near, now you have been reconciled to Him through the blood of Jesus Christ. Every morning when I pray, I say something like this, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that I have direct access to God the Father through the blood that you shed on the cross. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 19, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter God's most, heaven's most holy place. How? Because of the blood of of Jesus. The apostle Peter, who denied Jesus three times, later on repented three times and said this in his first epistle in the very first few words. He said in 1 Peter 1, 2, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago. His Spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed Him and you have been cleansed by the blood of of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that we can be cleansed by His blood today? The Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. There's not a sin you've committed that Jesus Christ 
cannot forgive you for. That's because of the blood of Christ. It was shed for you. And that's what Easter is all about. That's the good news of Easter, a bloody tree. The sovereign Lamb of God died that we might live. He owed, we owed a debt we could not pay. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. There was a wonderful hymn writer. He only lived to be about 35. His name was Augustus Toplady, but at the age of 35, he wrote a hymn called Rock of Ages. And there's one little phrase in there I want to share with you. He said, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Won't you cling to the cross today? Won't you come to the cross today? You say, I, I can't believe in that. I can't believe that God would cause his son to die. Oh, listen, Jesus was a willing sacrifice. He gave his life so that you and I could be set free. All of our sins atoned for. All of our sins washed away. Easter is the good news about a bloody tree. But if that's all there is, there is no good news. If Jesus is still dead, there's nothing different between him and any other religious leader. But there's something else about Easter, and I want to share that with you. Not only is Easter good news about a bloody tree, but Easter is good news about an empty tomb. An empty tomb. Look at verse 34 again in Romans chapter 8. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised. Now, what in the world does that mean? It was imperative that Jesus die on the cross for our sins if we're going to be saved. But if Jesus' death is all there is, then there is no good news. If there is no resurrection, if there's only a cross, then there's no salvation. No one can go to heaven. Christianity is a hoax, and we're all on our way to hell. That's exactly what Paul said when he wrote in arguably the greatest chapter in the Bible about the resurrection in all the epistles, 1 Corinthians 15. He said in verse 13 and following, for if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless. You ought not to be here if Christ has not been raised from the dead because I'm preaching a lie. That's what he's saying here. And your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we've said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. You are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we Christians are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. He's saying, listen, all of Christianity hangs on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If he has not been raised from the dead, then every Christian sermon is worthless. Faith in God and in Christ, that's all a sham. Jesus' apostles lied to us about God if Jesus has not been raised from the dead. Jesus is still in the grave. His bones are somewhere still outside of Jerusalem. And you and I are trapped eternally, guilty in our sin. Every Christian who has ever died is lost and in hell if Christ has not been raised from the dead. And every Christian who is alive right now is more to be pitied than anybody else on the world because we, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, 
We are living a fantasy. It's not good enough that we just do good works for people. It's not good enough that we mythologize the resurrection and say, well, his teachings rose from the grave. Well, his spirit rose from the grave in the sense that we still carry on his good teachings and all that. I got news for you. If Jesus didn't rise from the grave, we don't even need to be here right now. I don't need to be preaching. We don't need to be singing. But I have good news It's not all in vain. Jesus rose bodily, victoriously, and eternally from the grave, and He is alive. He is alive. On Friday, He suffered on the cross. On Friday, He died for our sins. On Friday, they laid Him in a borrowed tomb. Then on Saturday, His body laid in rest in the grave. But then on that first Easter morning, on that great glorious Sunday, it was getting up time. Amen. He got up out of that grave. He had been down in that grave. He had gone to hell. He came back with the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And he came out triumphantly. And he appeared to his disciples for 40 days. And then he ascended back to the right hand of God the Father. And he's ruling and he is reigning. And I don't care who is the president and who is on the Supreme Court. Jesus Christ is the Supreme Court. Jesus Christ is King of Kings. He's raised from the dead. You can't impeach him and he's not going to resign. Amen? He's alive. He's alive. I love what the angel said. These people came to the burial spot of Jesus to find a body. They found some angels and a tombstone that had been rolled away. And they said, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Let's say that together. He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee, the angel said. They were saying, everything is gone exactly according to God's sovereign plan. The grave could not hold Jesus. Death could not harm and conquer Jesus. The stone could not hold back Jesus, the light of the world. He has conquered death. He has conquered the grave. There is hope now for all of us. We can repent of our sins, believe savingly in Jesus, and forevermore have the gift of abundant eternal life. Oh, I thank God for a bloody tree, but I also thank God for an empty tomb today. I thank the Lord that there's good news. Jesus rose from the dead. But there's another part of good news mentioned in Romans 8, 34, and that is this. Yes, Easter is the good news about a bloody tree. Yes, Easter is the good news about an empty tomb. But I am so grateful today that Easter is also the good news about an occupied throne. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Look at verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us? There's a verse of Scripture in the Old Testament. It's the most often quoted Old Testament Scripture in the New Testament. Psalm 110, verse 1 where the Father says to the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And guess what? Jesus is right now at the right hand of God the Father. The right hand. That's the place of honor. That's the place of prominence. It's a place where Jesus is. He reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. You may take his name in vain. You may curse the name of Jesus, but I got news for you. Your curse will fall to the ground. You can't curse whom God has blessed. Amen. God has blessed him and given him the highest place in all the universe, the right hand of the Father. Jesus rose from the grave. And when he did, you know what he did? He appeared only to his disciples. We read about that again in that great text out of 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 3. Paul said, For I delivered unto you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, 
and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scripture. Now watch this. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, Paul says, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Talking about when he appeared to him on the road to Damascus. For I am the least of the apostles, and I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the ecclesia of Theos, the called out ones, the church of the living God. And so here he says, look, in his resurrected state, when he came out of the grave, before he ascended back to the right hand of the Father, Jesus appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, minus Judas Iscariot, more than 500 brethren. I hear some people say sometimes, well, there were only 120 people that were Christians when Jesus left this earth because that's all there were in the, the place of prayer on the day of Pentecost. Listen to me, there were 500 at one time that Jesus talked to in his post-resurrected state. I guess there were 500 in Sunday school and 120 in prayer meeting, all right? That sounds about normal. And then there was James who was the brother of Jesus. He became the first pastor of the church of Jerusalem. Then all the apostles, again, minus that one who betrayed him, Judas. And then Paul. And the Bible says this is exactly the way God wanted it to be. It would be during a 40-day period between the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. Acts 1-3 in his prologue to the book of Acts, Luke says, to these he, Jesus, also presented himself alive after his suffering, that is after he died on the cross, by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. For 40 days, He talked to his disciples for 40 days. He appeared to them. That's why they would be glad to be burned at the stake rather than to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they said, listen, we have seen him on earth. We have seen him on the cross. And yes, we are eyewitnesses. We have seen him. He is raised from the dead. And many, if not all of them, gave their lives for Christ not even flinching because they said they didn't die for a lie. They didn't die to perpetuate a lie. They died because Jesus had come out of that grave and appeared to them. And the Bible says that when he did, he gave them one final command in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has epirkamai come upon you. Same word used by the angel Gabriel when when the mother of Jesus would say, how can I get pregnant? I have never known a man. Gabriel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and Jesus will come in you. And what Jesus was saying is there's coming a day when the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And just like I came into Mary, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come into you. I just want to say this to you. It's better to have Jesus in you than with you. Amen. It's better to have the Spirit in you than on you. And he says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, and yea, to the remotest part of the earth. The gospel is not just for Western civilization. The gospel is for every tribe and tongue and people group in the whole world. God wants everybody to be saved. And right after he said that, he was caught up into heaven. The Bible says in Acts 1 verses 9 following, After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received Jesus out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, and intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gawking, looking up into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven and Jesus ascended to heaven. Now, what happened when he went back to heaven? Three things. Number one, Jesus came in as a triumphant king, and all of his enemies, Satan and all the demons, were behind him, and he was bringing them in to show that he had conquered death, 
hell, Satan, and the grave. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 8, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And then the Bible says in Colossians 2, 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. And then what's the second thing he did? He, first of all, marches into heaven as a triumphant king. Then he takes the role of being the great high priest, and he had been the Lamb of God. He had, slain, he had been slain on earth. He took his own blood. Jesus took his own blood, went into the real Holy of Holies in the heavenly tabernacle, and put his blood on the mercy seat as a propitiation, a, a sacrifice, an atoning sacrifice for your sin and for mine. Jesus did that. That's the second thing he did. And then the third thing he did was this. He went and sat down at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, 12, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having or, uh, obtained eternal redemption. And then it says in Hebrews 10, 12, but our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down at the place of honor at God's right hand, and that's where he is right now. You know what? Presidents and vice presidents and senators and House of Representatives and all those governors and all the state senators and all the state House of Representatives and all the Supreme Court justices in the states and all the mayors and the city councilmen and the county commissioners and all the politicians and all the great men and women of business and all the other athletes and all this other stuff all of them will come and they will go. But Jesus Christ will keep right on reigning. Nations will come and go. Armies will come and go. Generations will come and go. Ideologies and philosophies will come and go. Isms will become wasms. But Jesus will not come and go. Jesus Christ is King of kings. He's on his throne. He is reigning in power right now. And the Bible says he's going to come back. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. I tell you, our Lord is high and lifted up on a throne right now at the right hand of God, interceding for us. I'm so glad today. My life got changed 42 years ago. How did God change it? Through a bloody tree. My sins got washed in his blood. They're all gone. God put them in the sea of forgetfulness and put up a sign, no fishing. <laughs> and I was also saved because of an empty tomb. Jesus really is alive. And I was also saved because of an occupied throne. Regardless of who's in charge down here, they're not in charge. Jesus is charged. He is in charge. And it's because of Easter, because he rose and he's alive. The gates and doors are barred, and all the windows fastened down. Spent the night in sleeplessness, rose with every sound, half in hopeless sorrow, half in fear that day would find the soldiers coming through to drag us all away. Just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall, the gates began to rattle. A voice began to call. I hurried to the window. I looked down into the streets, expecting swords and torches and the sounds of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary. I went and let her in. John stood there beside me, and she told us where she'd been. She said, they moved him in the night, and none of us knows where. The stone's been rolled away, 
and his body, it's not there. We both ran towards the garden. John ran on ahead. We found the stone and the empty tomb, the way Mary said. And the winding sheet they'd wrapped him in was just an empty shell. Something strange had happened there, just what I did not know. John believed a miracle, but I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high. I saw them crucify him, then I saw him. Back inside the house again, my guilt and anguish came. Everything I'd promised him added to my shame. When at last it came to choices, I denied I knew his name. Even if he was alive, it couldn't be. Oh, but suddenly the air was filled with strange and sweet perfume. Light that shone from everywhere drove shadows from the room. Jesus stood before me. Thank you so much for watching this presentation from Bellevue Baptist Church. And you know, we want to be just like the Apostle Paul when he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I do all things for the sake of the gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus. That good news is just as important today as it was in the first century. And here's that good news. God loves you. He created you. He loves you with an everlasting love. But the same Bible that teaches that God loves all of us also says that we all have a problem, a spiritual problem called sin. We have all broken the laws of God. And the wages or the penalty of that sin is death, which means we're spiritually separated from God. But God refused to leave us separated from himself. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the eternal divine son of God. He came to this earth through the womb of a virgin. He had no sin when he was born because he was born of a virgin. And he never sinned even though he was tempted just like we are. And the Bible says, even though he was the sinless son of God, he went to a cross to die an atoning sacrificial death. He died in your place and in mine. He paid not for his sins, but for your sins and mine. He had no sins. And then the Bible says he was buried because he really did die. And then he rose from the dead, bodily, victoriously, and eternally. And now he offers you, he offers everyone, the gift of eternal life. How do you receive it? First of all, you have to repent. You have to turn from your sins and turn to Jesus. And then the Bible says you have to believe. You have to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that he rose from the dead to give you eternal life. And then you have to receive. You have to invite him to come into your life, to accept him as your Lord and Savior. And the moment you do that, you become a child of God. Would you like to repent and believe and receive right now? If you would, I'd love to lead you in a prayer of commitment to do just that. Would you just bow with me and give your heart to Jesus right now? Say something like this, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. I am a sinner. I can't save myself. You're the only Savior. I repent of my sins. I turn to you. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead. I receive you right now. Come into my life. Save me right now, Lord Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that and you were sincere, if you really repented and believed and received Christ, you're a Christian. God bless you, and thank you for watching this broadcast.